By the way, as I briefly mentioned about the upcoming session election, I hope that you will carefully pray for each and every one of them. In a way, I must say that um, our church has been really blessed by having good men uh, in the leadership. By all means, we are not talking about the session's perfection, but um, we are talking about faithfulness for the Lord's glory and, and his ministry. I think uh, we have a beautiful man, Elder Colin Gunn. I, I think I cannot complain about him at all. I'm so thankful for his presence in our midst. His um, work and ministry has been a great blessing to all of us, I believe. And um, Deacon Wykin, you know, I have never seen such an efficient man in terms of organizing, thinking through planning and uh, preciseness. Um, in terms of precision, I think you need to go to talk to him if you want to know about what precision is about. And I'm very, very thankful. And Deacon Boom, I think he's a pastor of our senior citizens. I know that uh, he has been really loved by our senior citizens, and I'm grateful. In the midst of his busy life, he has been visiting our senior citizens. Even yesterday, I was told that he, was, he, he visited three different uh, places. I'm very thankful. And, and uh, thank God for his prayers. And also, uh, um, Deacon Ma, you, you know him, how actively and passionately and sacrificially he's uh, serving uh, us and also serving God and for his glory. Uh, today he's sick, so he was not able to come to church. But yesterday he worked all day long uh, doing work in B. And thank God for him. And um, um, Deacon Kevin Alao, I'm so grateful that in his age, he came forward and he dedicated and gave his life to serve the Lord. And I'm grateful for his um, studies. You know, all the books he has to read are really tedious and very hard books, almost like ancient books. And, but uh, he goes through and, and he's the one keeping our church office day in, day out. And so I'm very thankful for, for him. And also, Deacon Jason, have you seen any man who is more gifted than him in terms of music, expressions, passion? And even today, I noticed that when he was playing piano, he puts really his, his strength on it. And so he lifted us up. And he has been in charge of our, our VFG and IF ministry and music, Bible memorization, and wonderful and hard work. And um, I was told that uh, VF. VFGers were well treated by him uh, at the end of, I think it was June, and he himself cooked most of the dishes, and people were really impressed by his cooking skills. And uh, thank God for him. And um, uh, Deacon John Wong, um, he is nominated to be the next elder. And um, there are a few obviously considerations for the, the nomination. Uh, he's, he's representing our younger generation. And also, he has been proven in his ministry for uh, Sunday school ministry for the last few years. In fact, for the last two or three years or so, we were really uh, having, we were go going through a very difficult time with COVID. And he really showed his uh, leadership and he gained respect uh, from, from us. And um, husband and wife team, as, as one team, Sister Josephine and um, Deacon John have been working together, dedicated themselves to serve God. So we have a wonderful group of people, and I pray that uh, you will continue to pray for them. We are blessed. And uh, young men, continue to serve the Lord faithfully, and someday it will be your turn as God calls you uh, for the ministry of God. Having experienced the spectacular displays of God's power through the promised Spirit of God on the day of Pentecost, <clears throat> the apostles demonstrated the power of God by healing a man born with disabilities. This man had never walked before, but he had been always carried by others to the temple gate for begging for people's mercy during all his life. He lived on almsgiving from the temple goers. While people were amazed and paid their attention to Peter and John as if they healed a man with their power or piety, Peter quickly dismissed their false assumptions 
by declaring that the crippled man rose up and walked in the name of Jesus. He accused the men of Israel for their spiritual ignorance by which they killed the prince of life in chapter 3, verse 15. He preached that Jesus died, but that the same Jesus rose up again from the dead. Thus, the main point of his message through this miracle was of the resurrection of Jesus, which they ought to hear, though it was the message that their religious leaders were um, really um, um, disliking very much, and they hated this message the most. By preaching the suffering, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, Peter did not forget to tell them that his message was not new, but the same message that the prophets of God in the Old Testament had preached. He exalted them to repent of their sins. Having heard of the story of the miracle in the temple, all the major figures in the Jewish community came down to meet the apostles. They were priests, elders, Sadducees, and the captain of the temple. They scrutinized the apostles by asking them a key question from their minds in chapter seven, uh, chapter 4, verse 7b. By what power or by what name have we done this? They were the chief rulers in the temple, and they had never recognized the apostles of Jesus as their company. They limited the work of God to their aristocratic mind that the, only the elite group like them was in charge of all the affairs of God's spiritual work, especially in the temple site. Thus, by whose power or by whose name was such an important matter to them? It didn't matter whether there was a miracle in their minds. Whose power did you do it? In a way, they politicized the supernatural work of God by the apostles in the temple. They were claiming their territorial authorities. They did not rejoice with the healed men and the excited crowd who saw the, the miracle. They saw that the healing was clearly a supernatural work, but they did not give glory unto God. It is probably a typical case of the fulfillment of, um, of Isaiah chapter 6, verse 10. Make the heart of these people fat and make their ears heavy and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and convert and be healed. So even though they saw, they couldn't see. Even though they heard, still they could not hear. They could not understand, even though miracle happened in front of them, their eyes. They were religious, but they were irreligious at the same time. They called upon the name of God, but their hearts were far away from God. They were busy and passionate with their religious duties and activities, but they harmed and hurt the people of God. They began to persecute the apostles of Jesus. No church is lack of such individuals, and we carefully need to examine our own hearts. We are going to study about the responses shown to this act of persecution this morning. Number one, how apostles responded to this persecution in verses 23 till uh, 30. Verse 23, and being let go, they went to their own company and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said unto them. And when they heard that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, thou art God, which hast made heaven and earth and the sea and all that in them is, who by the mouth of the, thy servant David had, hast said, why did the hidden rage and the people imagine vain things? The kings of the earth stood up, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For of a truth against thy holy child, Jesus, whom thou hast anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together for to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings, and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word by stretching forth thine hand to heal 
and that the signs and wonders may be done by the name of thy holy child, Jesus. Having read that message, obviously you could have lots of different impressions and different lessons from the passage. But the first thought today that came into my mind about the apostles' response to the situation was that they went to their own company. So when they released from their prison, they went back to their own company. Verse 23 says, and being let go, they went to their own company and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said unto them. Why is this so important a lesson? Well, it says they had their own company. The Greek word for their own company comes basically from one, one Greek word, meaning pertaining to oneself or one's own. It is universally used to refer to what is one's own as opposed to belonging to another. So they did not belong to something else, but to this group. In other words, they had a company they belonged to. Of course, they were a part, uh, you know, they were a part of the 12 disciples of Jesus. And we also know that there were 120 people in the upper room in Acts 1.5. The first converts were 3,000 people, chapter 2, verse 41. And more people came to the Lord and were added to the church, chapter 2, verse 47. About 5,000 people heard the apostles and believed in chapter 3, 4. So there were a lot of believers of Jesus Christ. Though all of them could not be in one place at the time, the same time, there must be a core group, Peter and John, were able to turn to. The description their own company implies that they had reliable and trustworthy people in times of even persecutions and trials. They had the same mind and understanding of the Lord's work and his truth. As soon as they were released from custody, they went to these people for many things including the report of their experiences with the authorities during custody consultation, encouragement, and prayers. I see this point very seriously and very importantly because I have seen too many Christians running on their own merry-go-round. They are solos. They do not belong to anywhere. They do not have, uh, they do not have a fellowship with the fellow believers. They may be uh, Sunday worshipers. They do not belong anywhere, and they behave themselves as self-imposing isolationists. I do not say that they are not spiritual because they have faith in God and desire to serve him. But they do not have any their own company in the Lord for prayers, for fellowship, and mutual encouragement even during the time of persecutions and trials. They say that they are happy Christians by being left alone. By being together with someone else, it bothers them, it disturbs them, so they chose to be alone. Well, they do not understand why the Lord taught his disciples to pray by beginning with the words like, Our Father in heaven. All Christians in God's church call their God, Our Father. There are Christians both neglecting and ignoring Christian fellowship and Christian solidarity. It is not a pattern for any believer to follow. There is, this is a part of the doctrine of the Church of Christ. As we have studied, a church is a believer's community devoted to the same beliefs, fellowship, celebrating the Lord's table, and prayers. Now the believers show their solidarity during the time of persecution and hardships. All believers must have their own company they belong to in order to help us out. There are various fellowship groups every one of us can belong to in our church. In a larger scale, scale the whole church should be our own company. Do you have your company to return to when you are released from your custody? in times of persecutions. I must give you a warning at this point. The isolated and separated believers for no good reason are often the targets of their enemy, the power of darkness. I have visited a few national parks in Africa. 
I saw how lions and cheetahs, lepers or hyenas caught their prey. They go out as a group and take different positions. They slowly approach the, uh, to, to the herds of such animals like gazelles or even wild beasts and run toward them almost at the same time. Then those animals attacked by an ambush begin to run for life and always, without any exception, there are a few leaving the group and trying to their own ways for survival. But ironically, always, without any exception, they are the final rewards for the attacking animals, attacking predators. Spiritual life is not much different. All believers are members of one body and fitted together in Christ. When they refuse to be fitted together and to live as one body, they begin to lose vital signs of their spiritual health, whatever their reasons may be. They may say, he or she or they are not right, and therefore I cannot be with them. Well, in the family, there are sometimes family feuds, conflicts and disagreements. They are extremely normal. But uh, when we are growing together, we are learning how to live harmoniously with those differences and disagreements, and we begin to learn to love one another. That is a family. That is a Christian community. That is God's community. If I begin to talk about the reasons why some people leave the believer's community and choose to be alone, even though they are inside of Christian churches, I could probably make a very long list. However, regardless of the reasons and excuses, they will, will be able not to escape from spiritual backsliding, but to fall into temptations, easy targets of the enemies. Second, the apostles reported whatever the chief priests and elders had said to them. They told them about every threatening word that their persecutors had spoken against them. They reported that they were told not to speak or teach in the name of Jesus at all in verse 18, chapter 4. In a word, they reported about the threats purpose to dissuade and discourage them from saying or doing anything in the name of Jesus Christ. It also teaches us that Christian churches have only one legitimate reason to be the target of persecutions and suffering, which is the name of Jesus Christ. The whole countrymen watched the apostles and their fellow believers of Christ and could not find any other fault but the name of Jesus to justify their persecutions and threats. We find a similar case from Daniel. Daniel's enemies were trying to find a fault with him, but they could not find anything. Daniel 6, 5 says, Then said these men, We shall not find any occasion against this Daniel, except we find it against him concerning the law of his God. What a testimony. 1 Peter 3, verses 13 and 14 say this, And who is he that will harm you, if he be followers of that which is good? But, and if he suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye, and be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. So if there is any, any terror or fear, actually, um, if we have done the things unrighteously, then that's the time we should fear. But if we suffer for righteousness, right, righteousness sake, we are exalted to be happy. First Peter 4, 1, For as much then as Christ hath suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind, for he that hath suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin. And in fact, First Peter chapter 4, verses 12 to 16 could be a very good challenging example. And um, it may give us great lessons. Would you like to turn your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 4, 12 to 16? Chapter 4, 12 to 16. Let's read them all together in unison. Behold... Think in us strange concerning the fiery trial, 
as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye, for the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part is evil spoken of, but on your part is glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evildoer, or as a busybody in other men's matters. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. Amen. So if there is any suffering or persecution, there is only one leg legitimate reason. That reason is the name of Jesus. Other than that, we are not to be in such a position to be blamed or persecuted. It's because we have done something wrong. Third, the apostles committed the matter to the Lord in prayer. So that was another response. Verse 24 says in chapter 4, Acts, And when they heard that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, thou art God, which has made heaven and earth and the sea and all that in them is. Amen. Humanly speaking, they did not have any power to fight against the rulers of the nation. After all, their master, Lord Jesus, was taken by them and crucified him. You know, they were facing a real, real challenging situation, and their lives may be uh, put, in, uh, put at risk, in fact. And um, it's a dangerous situation, but one beautiful thing is that they believed in the power of prayer. Do you believe in the power of prayer? You know, oftentimes we just casually say, I'm praying for you. I will pray for you. I have prayed about. Do you really, do you really believe in the power of prayer? I think if you really believe in the power of prayer and efficacy of prayer and a, power, a, a prayer answering God, I think you will pray. And that's why prayer meetings are extremely important. Join one another to pray together if you really believe that there is God who hears our prayers if you really believe that your prayers can be answered, if you believe in the power of prayer, I believe it. When the believers heard Peter and John's report, first of all, they were in one mind and one heart. They were able to relate the two apostles' ordeals and the ru rulers' threatening words to themselves as if they were the ones threatened because they had one mind and one heart. They had one mind. The Greek word for one accord is a compound word with two words. The first word is homos, which means one and the same or common or joint. The other word is thomos, means soul or spirit as the principle of life, from which it means breath or mind, temper, um, will or courage. Therefore, when we put those ideas together, the word for one accord literally refers to the condition pertaining to mutual consent or agreement by passion, will, and mind. There was oneness of everything in their companionship. That was in only Christian church. Apostolic church members were something like that. They were oneness. They were in oneness of mind, heart, of everything in their companionship. The hidden source of the power of the apostolic churches, early Christian churches, is found in this secret code, oneness of mind. Were there disputes in early Christian churches? Of course. Were there disagreeing people in the congregations? Of course. Were there sometimes false teachings so they had to argue and fight against each other? Of course, but still they were active, energetic, they were growing, and they were lively. What was the secret? There was oneness of mind of the believers, genuine believers. This invisible and intangible condition of the hearts of the believers is probably the highest attainment by the spirit-filled people. Why I cannot be one with the fellow believers? It's not, we do not have to blame other people. 
simply because because we are not spirit filled people. We are not mature enough to see the things right. I cannot but ask a question to all of you, the hofers at this point. Are you in one mind with me in the Lord's ministry? Do you have one heart with me in the ministry? If you are not in oneness of mind and heart with me, probably you have not learned much from me. And besides that, your life has not been changed and your character has not been transformed and God's word has not been really working in your, in you, in your heart. Are you? And uh, how about our church? If you are not in one mind with me in the Lord's ministry, then in the Lord's ministry, where is your heart? Where is it? The oneness of mind had its expressions in the Lord's kingdom and his work amongst the believers of Christ, corporate prayers. That was external demonstration of the oneness of their mind and heart. When they were in oneness, they joined for corporate prayers. They lifted up their voice to God with one accord. The oneness of their mind was deeply rooted in God by faith. They believed in God's nearness to them and his faithfulness to hear their prayers. When persecution was rare and threats were made against them, they did not depend on their own wisdom. They did not want to, they, they, they did not make themselves busy to make some plans or some strategies to get out of those situations, but they relied on God. Their defense strategy against the power of this world was not grandeur in man's eyes, but efficient and effective in God's eyes. They prayed together. They did not run away from the place of danger, but trusted in God. They believed that God who raised Jesus from the dead also could keep and preserve them from the threats of the rulers of this world. They, they believed in God. This is faith. They believed in God. They feared God more than men. The company to whom Peter and John went from the jail shared the same faith and conviction, which brought them together to the oneness of mind to pray together. God was the ground of their unity, and they were bound together by the same faith in him. The apostles assured themselves with the biblical prophecies. And so that was another way to respond to the situation, persecutions. Verses 25 and 26, Acts chapter 4. Who by the mouth, by, uh, mouth of thy servant David has said, Why did the heathen rage and the people imagine vain things? The kings of the earth stood up and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. Amen. They believed that God was in control, in other words. As they understood the biblical prophecies, they were content with his will, whatever form it might take. This wicked, wicked world regularly opposed God and his Messiah. Then now the prayer becomes more specific in verse 26. Against Jesus, Herod Antipas, the Jewish king, who killed John the Baptist and heard the trial of Jesus, and Pilate, the Roman governor who executed Christ, stood together. So in other words, the Gentiles and the religious leaders of Israel and the people of Israel were agreed together against the God's anointed, the Messiah. So Gentiles and the Israelites were arch enemies, obviously. They could not coexist in many ways. However, when they were against Jesus, when they opposed Jesus, they had a cooperative work. They made an unholy, ungodly, unrighteous agreement between them. Oftentimes, the greatest hindrances of the Lord's work are both within and without the church. So all the time, problems are not coming from the Gentiles alone, but within the church groups, inside and outside of Christian churches, hindrances of the Lord's work are to be found. The apostles acknowledge that the whole event was only Christological. So in times of troubles, their response was of Christ. By holding on to Christ and his lessons and his truth. Verse 27 and verse 28. 
for of a truth against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together, for to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. The life and ministry of the apostolic churches were wholly Christological. When they were explaining the situations, only the name of Christ is mentioned here. In other words, everything in their churches was of, for, and by Christ Jesus himself. The very existence of Christian churches rests on the truth of Jesus, which is God's holy child. So only Christ in church. If we have any disputes amongst us, it has to be only because of Christ. Christ or on Christ. Only Christ. That is our focus. The whole world is against God's anointed Messiah, Jesus. It makes a stark contrast with the confrontation of Christian churches with the world today. What is the um, fighting, conflicting point between Christian churches and the world today? Is it the name of Christ? When have you and I been persecuted because of the name of Jesus we have claimed to be our Redeemer? When has the world-renowned mass media accused the Christian churches because of the name of Jesus? Christians face challenges and oppositions from the world because of their own sins, misbehaviors, and wrong attitudes, unloving, and an uncaring spirit, hatred, unreconciled souls, The wicked agreement merely accomplished what God had already determined to do, uh, to do. So even though they made an evil plan, they could not do beyond God's providential plan. This is the mystery of God's predestination and man's free will. Men were wicked and they made evil plan, but they could not prevail God's providential work. And also the apostles made the specific prayers to the Lord. That was another way to respond to the persecutions. Verses 29 and 30. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word by stretching forth thine hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of thy holy child, Jesus. So they pray to behold their threatenings. Number two, grant that they may speak God's word with all boldness. Number three, grant that signs and wonders may be done by the name of Jesus. This prayer, especially the signs and wonders, this prayer was answered as Hebrews chapter 2 verses 1 to 4 uh, testify, indicates. Hebrews chapter 2 verses 1 to 4 says this. Therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received the just recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him? Verse 4. God also bearing them witness, both with signs and wonders and with the diverse miracles and the gift of the Holy Ghost according to his own will. Amen. So by the time when this particular section of the scripture was written, already signs and wonders were performed through the, the, the apostolic ministries and God testified. But God validated the preached messages by the apostles themselves. Therefore, God answered their prayers. And also, by praying to God in times of persecutions, they affirmed God to be the author of their confidence. So persecutions are Im uh, uh, imminent and right there, and their lives may be at risk. However, they believed that God was the one in control, not the authorities, not the persecutors. They did not run away. They stood firmly on their own feet by faith alone, and they prayed. 
to God for the situation. But interesting thing is that if you look at their prayers, they did not pray for themselves. But in fact, they prayed for the Lord's ministry and God's word to be preached. Believers did not pray for God to her thunderbolts of judgment on their foes. <laughs> yes. You know, sometimes some believers told me that they wish to pray bad things for their enemies. Lord, please uh, uh, make them have some accidents or something like that. <laughs> but in fact, uh, our apostles did not pray uh, such a prayer. They prayed merely that God would observe their persecution and grant them grace to be faithful. They prayed in submission, in other words, to the will of God. Will of God. They took persecutions as a part of God's providential will and they took it graciously by faith alone and they committed all the matters to God in verse 31 we can find how God responded to the situation verse 31 and when they had prayed the place was shaken where they were assembled together and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and they spake the word of God with boldness Prayer was a communion with God. The Greek word for pray in this verse is a common verb to express begging for something from both man and God. It tells us about their attitude toward this serious situation. They prayed for more divine signs, though the divine sign of healing the lame of man, lame man, caused them to be persecuted in the first place. The following supernatural work happened when they prayed. The place they gathered was shaken. Some people have said that it must be an earthquake. And by the way, some of the charismatic uh, people have told me that uh, when they received some sort of anointing of the Holy Spirit and so on, they were shaken and they are putting this particular verse as, as a, a proof text. But if you look at the verse very carefully, it was not individuals shaken, uh, but in fact, that the place where they were, the place was shaken. And uh, some people say that um, it was an earthquake. However, what I see is that this shake was a supernatural work that does not have any other natural cause like earthquake. It was like the manifestations of the Pentecost and was due only to the Holy Ghost. This miracle shows God's sanction and seal upon the principle uttered in this prayer. And they were filled with the Spirit of God. That's God's response to their prayers, to their persecutions. So if you look at some of those effects or events of the filling of the Holy Spirit, you can trace a couple of them. Uh, precedence. The Lord promised his disciples of the coming Holy Spirit in Acts 1 8, and it was fulfilled in Acts chapter 2, verse 4, when they were filled with the Spirit of God. And now in Acts chapter 4, verse 31, they were filled with the Holy Spirit again. What does it indicate? It tells us that the Holy Spirit would fill them again and again as the needs arise. So in other words, the feeling of the Holy Spirit is not just a one-time event. I was a long time ago filled with the Holy Spirit, therefore I'm just uh, carried on with that. No, that is not the case. The Holy Spirit does the same thing to his people today. That's why Ephesians 5.18 says, And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. So even today, it is a possible experience by the grace of God as we depend on him. And they spoke the word of God with boldness. Do you remember what they prayed for? This was, this was one of their prayer items in their prayer. It is also the result of the feeling of the Holy Spirit. When they were filled with the spirit of God, they were filled with God's word. It was an immediate answer to their prayer in verse 29. And Luke refers repeatedly to the holy word of God in the book of Acts. And uh, Thomas Walker classifies the references 
in his commentary on the book of Acts as follows. The word, the word of God, the word of the Lord, the word of his salvation, this salvation, the word of the gospel, the word of his grace, and the, the words of the Lord Jesus. By the Spirit's help, they continued their public teaching and preaching openly and freely as though the Sanhedrin had never made a threat. As if those threats uh, existed, they just kept on going with their preaching ministries with boldness. All happened because God answered their prayers, which was his, his response to the apostles' persecutions. Lastly, then how the rest of the believers, believers' community responded to the persecution in verses 32 to 37. Luke pauses to give a brief assessment of the spiritual nature of the church, which shows her response to the persecutions. So when persecutions are, are known to them, how the church was forming uh, themselves. Here, Luke lists their five spiritual traits in the times of persecutions. You may want to compare this passage with Acts chapter 2, verses 44 to 47. So you can do it at home. First, they were of one heart and of one soul. It's interesting. Persecution came upon them, but those persecutions or hardships, trials coming upon the church did not divide the Christians, the believers, but rather persecutions and trials united them together. Verse 32a says, and the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul. In the beginning of this message, we consider that the apostles went back to their own company. There was a believer's unity in heart and soul. Now we see that the whole church shares the same spirit. So persecution, hardships could not shake, could not change the Christian churches. What we should not overlook from this lesson is that the believers are expected to have a community life. They are expected to be a part of a congregation. After the first great influx of members in Acts chapter 2, verse 1, uh, Acts chapter 2, Luke describes the excellent condition of the con congregational life. So in chapter 2, later part of chapter 2, you found some of the lessons about the church life in early Christian churches. Luke describes the excellent condition of the congregational life. Now after a second great influx, so after uh, those uh, people who came to the Lord on the day of Pentecost, there was a second great influx. And after a notable victory over their opponents in chapter, uh, Acts chapter 4, he, Luke, again shows us the condition of the church. The congregation consisted of the multitude of people. It was made up of vast variety of people, old and young, rich and poor, and with many differences in occupations, gifts, temperament, inclinations, and etc., I think this is the beauty of Christian churches. There are differences. There are varieties of the backgrounds of individuals in Christian churches, but they become harmonious. They are united. How? By growing together. By growing together, we can come to that unity. It is God's will and God's plan to bring all those people from different backgrounds and different kinds of people God brought into his own congregation congregation. So thank God that there are differences. Some people may be impatient, while some people are patient. And some people may be very temperamental. Some people may be very um, steady. Some people have organizing skills, and some people are totally disorganized. Some people have far-sighted uh, ideas so that they could plan for the future. Some people are very good at immediate tasks. We are all different. Some people speak a lot. Some people don't say much. 
and all these differences coming together. And while we are being together, we are learning from each other so that we become better people in Christ Jesus. We are transformed to be like Jesus Christ. So um, as the church is made up of vast variety of people um, and uh, they are united, it shows their character. They learn to be harmonious. What held the congregation, the multitude of people together was their um, um, uh, one faith, same faith in God. Pay attention to the words that describe them in the same verse. Um, in fact, if you look at um, verse 32, verse 32a says, And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul. They were the ones who believed. They were the ones who looked unto Jesus by faith alone. What makes Christian churches or Christians weakened today is that they constantly look upon themselves while honoring God with their lips. So even sometimes when I propose certain things prayerfully out of deep thinking, sometimes objections are coming. Objections can be made, by the way. And different ideas and different, uh, different propositions could be made and different proposals can be made. But when something is brought forth with, with prayers, lots of thinking, People, when they oppose or object the proposer, they think, they say something like this. I think, I like, or I do not like, I agree or disagree. So in other words, I is more important than anything else. The unity is what I think, what I feel, what I like or not, or whether I agree, disagree without even prayers. As a result, they fail to have one heart and one soul with the body of Christ. They are like sands, never being able to build anything. And so if you are not in one mind and one heart with the church, you are building your buildings on the sand, which will not stand. Faith is the inner and essential bond of union in the church. The communion of saints is such by faith alone. Therefore, the ones whose focus is not on Christ alone may constitute the membership of an external church community, but, the, but their spiritual state betrays their subjective views of their spiritual conditions. They are not that much faithful. They are not that much spiritual, but they are regarding themselves too highly above themselves. As a result, they cannot be united with others in Christ Jesus. Faith must have its outward, external manifestations. Faith without works is dead. One of such faith works is to keep the oneness of heart and soul with the fellow believers. Obviously, in the center of this union, there is their ministers. Hebrews 13, 17 says, Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls as they then must give account that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. It is in fact true. Sometimes in the ministry of God, gladly and cheerfully, faithfully minister to everyone, to some minister with grief, to some Ministry with, uh, with gladness and cheerfulness. Therefore, if you are neither in agreement with the teachings of your pastor, or nor in the spirit of submission to his guiding principles for a betterment of your souls, I have been telling it all the time, you'd better find another pastor whose voice you are happy to listen to, or a different church with whose congregation your soul may be in unity. Otherwise, you may want to examine yourselves and your hearts and see 
whether there is any issue that you need to deal with first. By the way, you know, I have been telling it quite often. Moving home church is not a sin if that is God's calling. So joining a church where you can put your trust and confidence with a faithful spirit unto God, that is a wonderful thing. However, if something, those elements are missing, I think you need to pray deeply. And so it is something that for the benefits of our individual souls, we need to constantly pray for. And at the same time, when we are belong to a believer's community, we should be willing to give our hearts energy so that this ministry can be strengthened and it will be continued in the coming coming age. So succeeding generations will follow exactly the same truth. It's a spiritual battle. We just do not have enough energy to, to waste as we are trying to strengthening, strengthen the church and build up Christian church, not only for our spiritual benefits, but also for the benefits of our succeeding generations. I think all serious believers will testify that there are not too many churches to be able to give your assent um, or, or consent or agreement with. I hope that you love Hope Church. It is a good church. Um, it is not a good church because we have a good building, but because genuinely in our hearts, we desire to serve God according to the scriptures. It is a good church. It is because it, this is a church that proclaims and believes the scriptures as they are. God's word, inerrant to God's word, infallible word of God. And it requires spiritual maturity to understand such a lesson I just delivered. It is because one heart and one mind in one faith can be attained only by those who deny themselves forsake everything and follow Jesus. They are the ones who can confess that the one who lives in them is the son of God who loved them and gave himself for them. Many people's crisis, I think, on their lips only, but not in their character, not in their services, not in their love, not in their sacrifice, not in their faithfulness. Secondly, the congregation had all things had all things in common. Verse 32b says, Neither said any of them that aught of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things common. It was a manifestation of loving fellowship in the church. It was not a lesson about communism. It doesn't have anything to do with communism. In a word, they simply cared for one another. And at that time, this particular practice was encouraged and needed probably. No one said it is mine. Everyone regarded his possessions as not being intended for him alone, but to be employed for all as need required. This is truly remarkable, especially as we know the Jerusalem church congregation was not a small congregation. It was a big congregation. And this big congregation had that practice in oneness of mind. But no one was saying that anything of his possessions was his own. The apostles witnessed the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Verse 33a says, And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. They were enabled to preach before the general public. I take the word witness with all seriousness and with all interest I can have. So verse 33a says, and with great power gave the, the apostles witness of the resurrection. The reason that I take this word with great interest is because it makes the preaching of the resurrection of Jesus Christ more than ordinary ministry, but an obligation and duty, responsibility. Witnesses have duties to disclose what they have known and seen in relation to any event. The apostles were witnesses. They were bound to preach, the pure one. 
they could not but preach. It is more than a, just ministry, but it was a duty, it was a responsibility. And they had great grace upon them. Verse 33b says, and great grace was upon them all. Grace from God is always the secret of the church's strength and growth. Grace is another of the great theological words in Acts, although it can denote merely human favor. It regularly refers to the unmerited favor of God, determinative of our salvation. God's unmerited favor built up the faith and the love of all. In chapter 2, verse 47, the believers found the favor and good will of the general public. But here in chapter 4, Luke talks about God's favor. So in chapter 2, people found the favor from the people. Now in chapter 4, they found the favor from God. And they met their needs in verses 34 to 40, uh, 37. Neither was there any among them that lacked. For as many as were possessors of land or houses sold them and brought the prices of the things that were sold and laid them down at the apostles' feet. And this distribution was made unto every man according as he had need. And Joseph, who by the apostles was surnamed Barnabas, which has been interpreted the son of consolation, a Levite, and, um, and of the country of Cyprus. Having land, sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. There were both rich and poor believers in the same church. It shows the reality of life in this world, regardless of faith. Some people are richer than other people in Christian churches. The rich are mentioned here as the ones who are possessors of lands and houses. There were poor ones who needed financial assistance. But they have both same faith. Every congregation has a privilege to meet the needs of the needy. Poverty and need soon overtook the Jerusalem church in spite of this fellowship in Acts 11.29. This condition was repeatedly occurred and has continued till today in many parts of the world. world. Acts 11.29 says, Then the disciples, every man according to his ability, determined to send relief unto the brethren which dwelt in Judea. The distribution was being made from time to time as the needs would arise. The language here shows that we are not meant to infer that the men sold all that they had. There was no vow of property. And they simply remembered to be generous and gracious to the poor. Luke presents us a remarkable example of such generosity in verses 36 and 37. And his name was Joseph or Barnabas, which means the son of consolation. I, th I think this is a very interesting name. This title, the son of consolation, comes from the same root as the title of the Holy Spirit, comforter. In John 14, verse 26. The apostles felt that the ministry of Barnabas reflected the very ministry of the Spirit of God. And so he is given to us as an example. At the same time, he, the meaning of his name, Barnabas, fits to that situation. This is not just a double or triple tide. It is the complete sum given to the church. If everyone in the church had given everything they had, Altogether, it would not have been presented as an outstanding gift. It was an exceptional practice. So in other words, not everyone in even Jerusalem church did give everything they had. So in other words, it was not a communism. In order to distribute the collections to the needy, then the church must have known the conditions of its congregations. So in other words, members themselves know about others. Uh, each other. To the contrary, the modern Christians, modern day Christians have built strong walls and towers around them and do not allow anyone to come in. It is hard to build a community with the Christians this day. However, the communal life was one of the characteristics of early Christian churches. When persecution arose, the apostles joined the believers in prayers. 
They were in one mind and heart by faith, which was also demonstrated by mutual concerns about each other's needs. They prayed to God for his response by emboldening them to be able to preach the resurrection of Jesus and enabling them to show signs and wonders which could validate their messages of the resurrection of Jesus. God shook the place and the apostles became bold with the feeling of the spirit. The church showed the community spirit and the church, after all, was a community. It was all from persecutions. Then after all, persecution benefited the church and its members. Are you in trials? Then as the scripture says, rejoice. Do you know anyone in trials? Pray for him, pray for her, pray for them, encourage them. Are you laughing today? But remember that your laughing may not be continued forever. There may be a time for your mourning. All together, what we must learn today from this persecution and the responses to the persecution is to look unto Jesus in any circumstances. Apostles looked on, upon Jesus and God answered their prayers as they put their faith and confidence in him and the believers had the same faith in Christ Jesus. As a result, they were un one, they were united and they, are, they were harmonized in Christ Jesus by faith alone. My prayer is that we will be able to experience exactly the same thing. Our responses will be the same thing. And my greatest desire is to be able to see that our church is not just one another local church, but we'll be able to build a community, the believer's community. It's not just uh, saying, hello, how are you? Fine, thank you. That, that is not that. But beyond that, we care for genuinely each other and pray for one another. And I hope that you will find that consolation from your fellowship with the fellow believers in Hope Church. Let us look to the Lord in prayer. Father in heaven, we are grateful for early Christian churches and apostles and even persecutions. After all, persecutions benefited them in a powerful way, Lord. Help us to grow in the Lord. May help us to care for one another. Help us to pray for one another, dear Lord. Help us to be able to build a believer's community in our church, not just an organizational group, Lord, but our church is going to be truly an organic entity in Christ Jesus. And we are together and fitted together for the honor and glory of our God. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.